shirt with us. I like the shirt. Yep. Yeah, it was, it was. Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 So glad it didn't rain, right? Yes, yeah. of course. For Shinokan, I should have that. For JFAX, this is probably the best weather you could possibly hope for. It's not raining, it's not 100 degrees. It's probably as best as you're going to get. So, my name is Ben Crawford, and this is Building with Steve. As always, I make sure this is working. Audience participation is welcome. Questions at any time are awesome. Just make sure you raise your hand. How about so, <clears throat> why are you here? Anyone Steve want to answer that question? Rocks. Yeah. 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 How many people are here because they like steampunk? How many people are here because they want to build steampunk? Why not? Should I try it out? Yep. I'm here because I'm scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here because I told you to come. For participation. You will, though. You will have fun. I will. <laughs> Is that camera pointing? How that, how that Amy look on the camera? It's looking right at you, and it can still get her a little bit. Of a <laughs> Does it get the screen in? It gets the screen in for sure. Yeah. All right. I want to make sure. Yep. All right. So, this is also awesome. This is my lovely fiance, Chelsea. Hello! Hello. 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 She's her dress is nice as well. Yes, it is. Yes. I just made it to Yeah. So, like what that. is steampunk? This is a very, very hard question for some people because they can see, they know it when they see it, it's hard to describe it. Well, I describe steampunk as retrofuturism from the perspective of the Victorian industrial era. This is a time where they were really starting to realize the capability and the possibility of mankind. Where they were starting to dream bigger and really develop technology in a way that was never done before. Mass produced things. Things that people had never seen before. The automobile. Um, another one big thing is um, Jules Verne capitalized on this idea of anything can be made. That um, 200,000 leagues under the sea was considered one of the first steampunk books. And the style has continued ever since. Um, lies people tell about steampunk. These things, why people think they can't get into it. The biggest and boldest lie of those is, it's too expensive. I know, I've got a lot of people like, how much does that cost? Now, this is not just a rule for everyone, but this arm right here, and materials alone, just cost a lot under $300. And that's mostly because all of all the leather. I custom made this out of leather I bought from a handy leather factory. So, don't have to say you have to spend as much as I did to make something awesome. A lot of great steampunk comes from found items and things you get all the length, and I'll tell you where you can find those items later. I don't have enough skill to make anything good. Nonsense. Absolute <laughs> nonsense. Everyone has different levels of skill, and everyone has to start somewhere. It's not a skill you're born with, it's a skill you develop. It takes too long. That how long it takes all depends on your per how you are. The staff right here took me about a day. I put my outfit together in a day. Yep, you put an outfit together in a day. It does not take months and years to make something good. I made this entire arm in two months. Everything you know, from beginning to end, planning to begin, it's all going to take me two months. Steampunk is a fad and won't last. <laughs> As I said, <laughs> Steve Pump started, it's been a hundred years. I think it's going to be around for a, while, a little a bit longer. And I don't know enough about the style to make anything. <laughs> That's what Google's for. Yeah, Google is your friend. Things everywhere. Steve Pump is a really easy style to start with because Unlike anime, where you have to be, you know, true to the character, you have to catch every little detail, you have to make You're it. Your own you, know, character. Like, you are your own character. You basically make things to fit the character that you develop for yourself. I see steampunk people who he's a bartender, so he had a bag on, he had a uh, pack that actually dispensed drinks. Oh, that's so nice. nice. So you can make it be what you want it to be. So you are your own character. Don't let fear stop you from starting. That is the number one hang-up for anyone starting to make anything, 
is they're worried they're gonna mess up, and that's what they're gonna screw up, they're going to be able, they're not gonna be able to make anything, and they're just gonna waste their time and money. Failure is the best teacher. Recognize it. Recognize that failure and discouragement is the part of every single project. No matter how good you are, every professional will tell you they screw up on every project and they get discouraged on every project. It's just part of the process. If you recognize that and prepare yourself for that eventuality, and you say, okay, I screwed this one thing up, I'll fix it, and I'll cover it up. Just keep going. Don't get discouraged, oh, it's going to look horrible. I got so discouraged on this arm, I stopped for about three days. I was just like, oh, this is going to be horrible, I'm wasting my time, I'm wasting my money. But I got back to it, I looked at it like, well, I made this mistake here and there, and a lot of this is covering up the mistakes I made in this part right here. Don't get discouraged, and if you do, realize it's temporary. It's part of the process. Work through it. What we'll be covering in this panel is the three main parts of what well, I think building steam pump. First one is tools. What kind of tools do you need to be able to build effectively? Two, materials. What kind of materials can you use? Where can you find them? And what can you do with them? Design. What is involved in designing steam pumps? Some of the thought process you go through in making something that not just looks cool, but also has what I call an aesthetic that a logic to the design that kind of helps people get over the dispension of disbelief when they're looking at a device. Part one, tools. All projects start with the right tools. Having the right tool is always better than going without. I know that sometimes I have geo-rigged things, I've done tools, things with tools that they shouldn't do, and <laughs> I wish I would have had the right tool for the right project because it will cut your time in half. I mean, it's not even a fourth if you have the right tool. Always try to include the cost of the tool and the cost of the bill. But you don't think about this, oh, I need, I'm going to spend $50 on this bill, but I need three tools to make it. Include that in the price. So not only when you're building a project, you say, okay, this cost me this much money, but now I have tools I can use for future projects. That's always something I try to do is, oh, what tool am I going to need that I don't have that I can build into this project? It helps you be able to do budgeting as well. The last one is, and I'm trying to remember exactly what I put in there, projects are so, uh, are so much easier when you have the right tool, like I was saying. This is something that I wrote up and I put it on my website. If you want to go to tinkerspack.com, it's on there as well. What? Tinkerspack.com. <laughs> She'll write down over there. This is I called the $75 toolbox. This is everything you need to start. And it'll only cost you $75 if you go to the places that I went to. And I have price will be on the screen where I got them. So so with a toolbox. I know some people will think $30 is a lot for a toolbox, but it's not. Toolboxes are the foundation of your set. They are what holds all your tools, and you want to get something that's big enough, and has enough trays, and enough slides, and enough drawers to hold everything you need. Toolboxes just don't hold your tools, they can also hold some of your materials. Like mine holds my rivets, tape, glue, all sorts of other things that you don't think about as just tools go into your toolbox. So don't skimp on them. Now, I bought a really nice toolbox. It's not the one in the picture. None of these tools I actually, the ones I in the picture. But I bought my toolbox for about $30, and it is the best investment I could have possibly made. You need short and long needle nose pliers. Well, one's a needle nose, one's just pliers. The reason why you need two is because the leverage is way different on a pair of needle nose pliers than they are on regular pliers. The longer the nail is, the different the leverage is, and you might ruin things when you're trying to strip something from a very long needle nose because you have the wrong kind of leverage, and it'll bend things in a way you don't want. Now, you could go cheap, and you could buy dollar store needle nose pliers, but in my experience, the metal in those will bend really easily, and they don't mostly bend the way you think. They'll twist, and they'll become useless to you. I've had to have so many different pairs of pliers, it's not even funny. So if you spend... The you know four dollars each on these, you'll not be sorry. Claw hammer. This one, do it at the dollar store. The dollar store is a great place for tools. You just need a hammer. They have claw hammers, decent sized ones. 
for just a dollar, and you'll be surprised how many times you'll get hammered. You can get without the claw on it, but most of the time the claws are really good for getting things out. You would want screwdrivers. I recommend one big and one small. You don't have to go so. No. Those are too expensive. I got one for 20 bucks. Well, not a real sonic screwdriver. That costs, you know, an entire time work. <laughs> so I always get one big uh, Phillips and one big flathead, one big um, um, Phillips head. I don't know what I call it, Phillips head. I think it's stupid. Um, and you get these at the dollar store as well. It's really good because even if you make a steampunk, sometimes you'll get things you need to screw in, things that you need to uh, even use it as a uh, bit of a pick to get things out. It's really good to have these screwdrivers around. Shears. Now these ones I use constantly. I use them to cut leather all the time. And you want a big, sharp, strong pair of shears. Now here's something that they don't tell you in a lot of places. Does anyone know the number one thing you do not cut with scissors if you want to keep them sharp? Paper. Paper. Or paper. Do not cut paper with your knife or shears if you want them to stay sharp. There is something about the way paper is made about that is almost designed to weaken and um, dull your scissors and your blades and your knives. So if you have a pair of scissors that you use just for paper, keep them just for paper. If you use it on your blades and then on your scissors, they will dull them almost instantly. Not instantly, but dull the, 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 it will dull them constantly as soon as you use it. Please don't use paper on your good blades. Hole punch. Did you even guess how many times I need the hole punch? <laughs> <laughs> so hole punches are very important. This one is the exact same model. Of, yes. Okay. So there's you know the belt hole punches and there's paper hole punches and they have the different pressure on them. Yep. Which one is preferable to use because you don't want to destroy the material yep. by using a belt punch? This is, the, this is exactly like the one I have. It has different kind of sizes on it. And you get this one at Menards for five bucks. It's the one I use, and you can also get one for a little bit more expensive, different kind of design at like different places. But this is probably the cheapest one you're gonna find, and it's really nice. If you, you know get it? a, what? If you get a paper hole punch, it probably you mean like a little one? Yeah. And they'll say you would cut. Material. It doesn't cut leather. You would cut through leather. Yeah, Plus, no, it's like not like leather, but for other stuff maybe. For other stuff oh, maybe. Like craft foam. They'll cut the cut craft foam. Yeah, the only thing they do. Ones. Yeah. One thing you need to do with craft like that, the fabric store. Oh, yeah. Much money. Yeah, they're overpriced fabric stores at the craft stores. Yeah. yeah. Modern Arts have them for five bucks. You can use for fees for craft foam. You just you have to, with craft foam, the only difference is you have to hold it and then turn it to get it to cut into it a little bit more. Because okay. foam will compact more. And if you do a turning motion, it turns these little tiny things into a blade. Okay. It'll cut through it. With leather, because it's so stiff, it has a breaking point. And it's a lot easier to get a clean punch with this on leather than on craft foam. I actually made a mock-up of the hand of this with craft foam, and I used my hole punch to make the mock-up. Okay. Tape measure. Kind of goes without saying. Anyone remember the old adage for tape measures? Measure twice, cut once. And I, I tend to go with measure three times, cut later. <laughs> because I know that... I always measure before I start my planning, and then I measure right before I cut. Because <coughs> in case I messed up, it doesn't screw me up. Exacto knives. Now, there may be some names for these. I just call them exacto knives, even if they're not an exacto knife off brand. I just call them that. Same rule applies to exacto knives as they apply to scissors. Do not use them on paper unless you have a blade specifically for paper. Another thing, this is a safety concern. Zacto knives are not made to last for a very long time. Most people hurt themselves by having a dull blade and trying to cut something. They put an extra pressure on it, force it, it breaks, shats off, and cuts you. Make sure that if something is not cutting as easy as it used to, change the blade. Use that blade maybe for something that's really, you know, something else, or throw it away. Because Zacto knife blades wear out very, very fast. And if you use a dull one, you'll put too much pressure on it and you'll hurt yourself. I don't want to see you anyone hurt yourselves. Yes? Yeah, my sister's an artist and she says that the, the replacement plates are cheaper than the hospital bills, so... Yeah, exactly. Yeah? 
Also, your cutting surface underneath is usually the most common cause of dulling the blade. Exactly. So watch what you're cutting on, something soft that you will probably cut if good. Yep, I have a desk at home. It's a really crappy old desk. But it is better to cut into that because it's a really you know, old particle board that cuts pretty easily than having a metal or a stone surface that will dull your blade as you cut through the end of it. Or you can do is you can kip a block of wood, like a, uh, you get, sometimes you'll get really cheap dollar store uh, um, cutting boards that are made of wood. Those are really good because it won't dull your blade when you're going through the wood. This is not as fast. Pens. Well, people don't think about having pens in their box. I, with a dollar store, I got a set of pens and I still use them today. Pens are really good because if you want to make a nice clean line or something, and you don't want to score it, you don't want to use a marker, you want to use a pen. Just common sense. Markers. Again, there are some materials that will not, a, a pen will not mark, like metal. Metal cannot, we cannot mark it with a metal because it just doesn't hold. Markers are really good for that. With markers, you want to remember that the thickness can mess up your measurements. So always make sure that you are um, you're making the mark along the line and you're cutting on the, what side of the line you're cutting on because that will screw up your tolerances on how close something will fit. And a lot of times I made a measurement, it's just a little bit off because I cut on the wrong side of that line. Another thing, getting things, I'll go back real quick. I also recommend get a pair of metal, uh, it's a metallic sharpies. That's what I did the design on this with. <coughs> they come with silver, gold, and bronze, and they're actually really nice because if you have something that's very, very dark and you want to draw a line on it and use a regular sharpie, you can't even see that line. Metallic sharpies help you to see a better line and it really helps to stand out on something that's really, really dark. Tape. Pretty simple. I like to pick scotch tape because you have nice, a lot more hold than you have the much smaller one. And again, you can get this at the dollar store. Glue sticks. Glue sticks are really, really good for leather because of the fibrous nature of the backs of leather. It holds the glue sticks rather well. If you're having a porous contact to another porous contact, glue sticks works remarkably well. I want glue is probably the best brand to get, but if you, whatever the dollar store has, it's probably a really, really good buy. A ruler. This is not always just for measurement, but it's a great straight edge. It's probably the cheapest straight edge you're going to get. These are the dollar store. I use mine daily. This is a little item that people don't think about. These paper clips are probably the cheapest vices, grips you're ever going to get. For small projects, you can use these to hold things together while the glue is setting. You get a side of them for a dollar, a nice big pack, and they are really cheap, really effective ways of holding things together while glue dries, or while you're punching something and you want to make sure it stays lined up. Really good to have in your box. Now, these are items that are not included in the $75, I have, I use them all the time, and I highly recommend it if you have the money to get them. First one is a drill and hardened drill bits. A hole punch will not punch through metal. Not even thin metal, because it's not designed to do that. I all the holes, all the metal, I had to drill with the drill. And you want to get hardened drill bits because they will go through metal and they'll go through wood, and it's the most bang for your buck. Some people say they get drill bits just for metal or some just for wood. If you get the hardened drill bits, it'll go through anything, within reason. And the reason why I was recommend this kind of drill, this has a removable head and you can put other tools on it later on. You can put a sander, you can put a routing bit on it, you can even put like a, all kinds of different tools on it. Digital caliper. I just got one of these last week and I love it to death. I do a lot of mock-ups of some of my stuff. If anyone here have Adobe Illustrator? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me what Adobe Illustrator uses for its measurement system. This is a dot scale. So instead of saying something's uh, an inch and a half, you say 1.5. So a digital caliper will be able to measure the exact size of something down to either the point scale or even the millimeter scale. <coughs> Helps you to really plan out your projects if you want to diagram something out. You want to know, okay, I'm using this pipe. How big is this pipe? Inner diameter, outer diameter. Allows you to mock things up really easily. Really, really useful for doing your diagram. And everyone knows what a Dremel tool is, right? Dremel tools are great for detail work. 
They make sanding so much faster because sanding wheels helps you shape wood. They're a little expensive, but the money you'll save in time is amazing. They're great tools, great things to use. Part two, materials. Materials I use for steam pump. Obviously, brass. Brass is one of my number one favorite materials for steam pump because the look of it is just amazing. There's something about brass that's just so much more pleasing than regular metal. Wood. I'm using uh, wood right now. I'm making a steam pump rifle from scratch, just cutting out the design on a piece of 2x4, and I'm sanding it down to a barrel gun. And the cheapest way you can uh, make a steam pump rifle is just get a piece of wood, cut it, and sand it down to make a barrel, to, to make the stock. PVC. The barrel of my gun is going to be PVC. And there's another material I'll see why that's all good. Leather. Obviously. The well, great place to get leather is, leather, is Tandy Leather Factory. And I'll get to that. Are you talking real leather or pleather? Never. Even, I don't. I don't. I don't even believe pleather exists. I just <laughs> really ignore its existence whatsoever. I do. <laughs> because pleather will never look as good, and it will even if you make it a little bit cheaper, it will always look horrible. Especially in team pump, it doesn't fold the same way. And I don't know, but I love the sound of this. <laughs> pleather doesn't make that sound. That, that sound of creaking leather doesn't happen with leather. <laughs> fabric. Like the jacket. Fabric is something that people overlook a lot of times when they're actually making steam pump. They think about this, they think about the goggles, they think about everything but all the clothing else that comes with steam pump. The vests, you know, the hats, the ties. EVA foam or craft foam. Awesome. I love this stuff because you can also metalize it and have like build something up in craft foam, cover it in a metalized substance, and it looks like metal with none of the weight but all the benefits. And that comes with one of my favorite things that no one knows about, metalized tape. Metalized tape is the godsend for every crafter. Anytime you've ever thought about, I want to make something that looks metal if I don't want the weight, get metalized tape. They have some in brass, they have some in just plain metallic. And what you can do is, you can take on this made craft foam, put this tape on, it's definitely only about that wide, but it's real metal. It's real thin metal with adhesive back. And what you can do is, you can, you can actually brush it and age it, and you can actually blend the edges of each of them, and to make, give a real metal finish, and a real aged metal finish, to a real aged metal object. It is amazing. You can take this stuff, and you can make anything look metal, and that's because it is. Yes. Where? You can get it at almost any hardware store. Okay. It's normally in the duck in the duck walk aisle. Because they use it because they can actually solder to it. Oh. Sometimes they use it for stained glass, I think. They actually some of the stuff I have in here, like this right here, this tape is actually the brass version. They use that for stained glass windows. And I got that online. So some of the um, fasteners I use for the something I make is rivets. Rivets are not as hard as people think. You don't need a rivet gun. What you can do is you can get uh, what's called double cap rivets, where they just one snap together and then you just put either a hammer together or apply uh, pliers and crimps it and it'll mushroom the head into one other. These are double cap rivets. And apparently they're coming out. So I had to fix that. Yes? For the, uh, the soldering tape for, that they use with stained glass. Yes. They have it at Hobby Lobby, too. Oh, they do? Yep. I just bought mine online because it was cheaper. Yeah, I saw it at Hobby Lobby yesterday. I, I got a roll, big roll of it for like 99 cents. Oh, nice. So, look online. Stuff is always cheaper online. Bolts. If you look at the, the um, this I made for a long time ago, these are all just screws on the back with brass cap bolts on the top. You can get these at um, Home Depot. They come with the, they're limited on size, but they work really nicely if you don't have if you don't want to work with rivets, you can work with these. They're really nice and they have more of a big physical uh, mechanical look to them, which is really cool. I have something to say. Yes. I really like the way those look. When you're making it, you want to keep in mind if you use bolts that that you're gonna feel the screw on the other side, so give it like more room or it's gonna But that one's good. Weaving meditations. Yeah. <laughs> Glue. But yeah, like I said, glue sticks work really well. Elmer's glue works really well. 
and something that you really don't want to use a lot of. Now, epoxy is slightly different than glue. Does anyone can tell me why you want to use epoxy over glue? Anyone know? It's stronger. It's stronger, but there's another reason why. It's flexible. If you have something that bends and flexes, if you use glue, that will break up that hard uh, seal. Plexi, um, epoxy bends. So you have something that is, has a joint and it's meant to bend and move. Epoxy is like rubber when it cures. So it will flex and it will move and it will keep its hold. So if you have something that's moving around a lot, you want to use, use epoxy instead of glue. And tape is really good if it's something that you don't see. I use some tape and some, here, and some of the twins here that you can't see them because the tape's holding it down. Like, if you look underneath these pieces, tape's holding it down. If it's something that people cannot see, sometimes the easiest way is just tape. So where to find this kind of stuff? These are the questions I get a lot is where do you find the materials that you use? Antique shops are fantastic. I got this piece, and I got these pieces, and I got this piece, and I got this stuff from antique shops. Always look at something on what it could be and not what it is. It's a really great way to just say, hmm, what can I turn this into rather than what is it now? Thrift stores is a good thing as well. Thrift stores doesn't have as much of the older stuff, but you'd be surprised what you can find at a thrift shop. And you don't cry, you have to cut it off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Salvation Army is also a great place. They had to have older things. There's a Salvation Army by my house that's paid by the pound. Actually, it's um, in Jenison, in Jenison, but uh, Granville. It's paid by the pound goodwill. They have these big bins, and you just load your stuff up. I buy belts there all the time for like loops and for the buckles. And sometimes I'll buy leather purses, and I'll cut, le cut leather backing out of it and use it for something. Very, very cheap materials. Goodwill, same kind of thing. Yard sales. Most people don't think about using yard sales as a way to get things. Go to yard sales with a mind of what can I use as a material for my crafting? And of course, the internet. The source of all human information and a lot of other things that you don't want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the good retail stores you can buy things at. Things I go, I shop these places all the time to get good materials. Menards and Home Depot. I sell up my entire um, list of anything that's not a dollar store, it's Menards. Menards has a great prices and some great staff. Also, plumbing stores. This little circlet here and this one here came from a plumbing store. It is what is used to, uh, it's a slip bolt connector. And it uses the force it against the, to lock against the wall so it doesn't shake around. You can get them there brass or you can get them regular metal. And you can get, it's really, really useful and they look really cool, especially when I got them from my goggles as well. Candy Leather Factory. I'm going to start off saying they're not paying me. I shop so much there, they probably almost pay me a salary to talk about them, but I love Tanny Leather Factory. There is one locally, it's on 36th Street and near Division. Uh, 36th Division. They have the cheapest leather, the most supplies, the most tools, the best know how of anywhere in the area. That's why I got all the leather from this, I got from the bargain bin. And I only paid about $30 a roll. The rolls are probably about this big by this big. And you can get the bargain bin are really, really good prices. So if you want to start working with leather, talk to them. They'll teach you how to do it. They'll tell you the tools you need to use. And you can get leather at really good prices. They even have a uh, membership program where if you are a member at certain levels, you pay one, one price per year. And it literally decreases all the prices in the store. You have like regular level, gold level. At gold level, you're paying like half to a third of what everyone else pays. It's a great program, and I highly recommend that you're going to buy a lot of stuff. And of course, like somebody said, Hobby Lobby. It's a great place for little things, but it can be a little expensive. But I would say I recommend Hobby Lobby for brass plating, because that's why I got this brass plating from Hobby Lobby. Part three, design. This is the part people get hung up on, like, well, I might know where I get materials, they might know where they can get um, anything else like that, but they don't know what are the design problems, what are the, how do I actually design something. So, there is something I like to call design logic. I described it for, for a little bit earlier. Everyone has what is called a suspension of disbelief. How easily is it to believe what you're wearing is a real device? 
Now, there are three elements where I consider something that is a really a logical design. You have what's called the power source. Now, this can be just a big block. For me, this is my power source. This is where everything comes from. It is the start point. It is where the energy comes from, the power, your whatever mes mysterical, um, uh, your mythological device, whatever is powering it, the real or imaginary, that's where it's coming from. Next is the magic box. The reason I call this magic box is basically the thing that does something and you have no idea what it does. This is my magic box. Things go into it, it does something, and it comes out. Then also it is an output. It does something. My magic box does something, it sends light through the wire. These three devices, these three things, will help give a logic to all of your devices. So if you say, oh, there's a power source, it goes into there, does something, and outputs this. If someone sees that, they don't have to ask you what it does as much because there's a logic to it. Every single device in the world follows the same principle. Look at the cell phone. You have your power source, the battery. You have the magic box, the internal guts. You have the output, the display. Every device in the world follows the same pattern. So when you use that same pattern in your designs, it will help you to kind of get over people's suspension of disbelief and give your objects a more real feel to them. Now, having a vision in mind is very, very important for steampunk. By vision, I mean, there's one thing that I love about steampunk is you are your own character. Your character helps drive your design. Are you a ship captain? Or are you a bartender? I saw a video with this guy, I know. He has a bartender character that he does. He has a pack on his back that actually has two bottles and pumps, and he can dispense drinks. And it's all made with a steam pump. Your character drives your design. What are you? How do you want to pull yourself together? If you figure out what your character is, it helps you to drive your design. Yes? What would you call yourself? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> My character I have with this, he is a scientist. He got into an accident, and his arm, well, he also used to his arm. So he developed this so he can keep working on his arm, with his arm. Your character helps drive your design. You can give a reason for everything you have. He's out of the cane. He, he was in an accident. He has a limp. I don't always live when I'm using it, but today because I lost the bolt. Are you a successful scientist by the sounds of it? Not so much. No. <laughs> hey, but, but no, you, but, but, when you're an inventor, <laughs> when you're an inventor, <laughs> things happen. <Yeah>. <laughs> C4, you know. Yeah. Uh, bits and pieces. I was, I was trying to get inside of a blue, trying to get a blue box, and it just didn't work very well. Uh, <laughs> you know, he is a winner. He is a winner. Is this compound stable? No. Okay, yeah. Yeah. try the next he one. He never the parking brake off. Because in the Victorian era, a lot of things were new. So I recommend giving everything a bit of an aged look because when you build it, it has a bit of wear and tear because nothing goes always according to plan. If you're like a ship captain, I recommend putting some battle damage into your costume. You've been through some firefights. You know, your Zeppelin is not exactly the most unrated thing in the world. So you get attacked, you repel them, you take damage. I like these goggles I saw a friend of mine made. They actually put um, cracked in a, cra a special crack in the glass. That looks like there's a bullet went through it. And it's, it's real cool battle damage you can put out another air of realism. So, the style of do's and don'ts, I think, of steampunk. Now, a lot of these are my own personal views, and some of them are more general, so kind of take what you will from them. This one is um, stay away from anything that looks too modern. In my very first steampunk gauntlet, I used a pair, a piece of uh, flex tubing that had a metal case around it that looked, that looked very, very modern, and I probably shouldn't have done that. If you want to stay away from things that look like they would not have existed in the Victorian era, it's really hard sometimes, but if you get something that looks too modern, you can always make it look older by adding to it, distressing it, 
and making it work. So try to stay away from things that look too modern. It does not have to have years on it. Can you find a single <laughs> year on my alpha other than that? <laughs> years have a purpose. If you put glue in gears on something without purpose, it bugs me. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Is it does not have to have gears on it to call a steampunk. That's my personal rule. There's even a song that, that says, glue gears on it to call a steampunk. That just doesn't work. That's my own personal rule. If you can make it work for the costume, to make it like they're doing something, that's different. Leather and brass are your friends. Leather was the predominant use for any kind of structural uh, armor back then. For those, because leather straps, leather was very, very durable. A lot of those were made out of leather. Brass is one of the best materials. Yes? Where did you get the stuff for your goggles and your hat? Oh, the actual goggles themselves are... Um, welding goggles. I got them online, and I got these kind of these rings from uh, from uh, Goggle and Plumbing, and the uh, jewelry glass I got from Harbor Freight. Tell them what the, the rings were originally for. I, I think I kept down a couple of them. They were slip knot connectors for uh, plumbing. Oh, they're yeah, from the uh, plumbing store. Yeah. So, leather and brass are really great things to have. You don't have to make the leather yourself. You know, like leather belts. Yep. Okay. So you get the, the, the pipes from a plumbing store. How do you get the glass that fits in the pipes oh, perfectly? Or? It's actually not glass. It is a plexiglass. Really thin oh, okay. plexiglass. Oh, I got it from Hobby oh, so Lobby. You can probably, um, like my dad and I do some like acrylic setting stuff. Yeah. If you get clear acrylic, you can make it right to size. Yeah, exactly. It's really different easy ways. This is really, really, really cheap, thin um, plexiglass. I just cut it with a little scissors. Now, always make sure you cut it a little wide because it will fracture as you cut it. So, if you cut it wider than you really need to, then you can easily it's easier to trim it down later. Yep, I was going to say, could you cut it with a Dremel tool? Oh, yeah, easily. The reason why it's harder to cut with, uh, with scissors because it, it, it flexes it when you cut with scissors. Right. But if you cut with a Dremel tool, it's a lot easier and you can probably get away with a lot of breaking. Now, when in doubt, go Victorian. The Victorian era is the main point of steampunk. Now you could go. Now a lot of things have subgenres of a subgenre. So there's like steampunk western, which is you know wild west and steampunk mixed those together. But when in doubt, look to the Victorian styles. Google Victorian styles, and you'll get an idea of some of the things that they would have worn. And uh, when in doubt, Google it. Just don't break your ribs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or your toes. And get some goggles. Some people say that it's a steampunk without goggles. I'm not saying it is, but goggles look cool. And <laughs> I was like, oh, the, God, the goggles were the very first steampunk thing I ever made, was the goggles. That's how I got started. And make it wearable for the long haul. I did not do this with my very first gauntlet. It was ungodly heavy. I use a lot of plumbing parts, a lot of metal parts, and it will pull on your arm, and it will make it unwearable. Also, make sure that you're mounting things correctly and giving enough counterweight. Like this cross strap takes a lot of the weight off of the gauntlet. That means it's coming down across the shoulder because it pushes down my shoulder instead of sliding down. Make something wearable. I always say if you build something, wear it for the entire day. And where it pinches, where it, you know, it hurts, fix those before you go to a convention when you can't. That was, when you say that convention, you can't fix it. So try wearing it the entire day, and it will make it easier to figure out what is wrong, where the pain points would be, and what wear points would be. Just a few final tips, then we'll go into question time. Experiment. Don't just make something because you want to wear it. Try a new technique. Try a test. Try to try something you never tried before. Get experience and learn something new. Make prototypes using cheap materials. Like I said, I made this gauntlet first out of craft foam. Because craft foam has some of the similar thickness and a little bit of the same kind of bend as leather. So you can get a pretty decent um, facsimile using craft foam, which is like a dollar sheet for like something this big. Really easy to make demos out of it. Be creative. Always think about something what can be and not what it is. 
or try to think outside the box. It's really, really fun to go to a hardware store and tell someone what you're looking for, and then tell them what you've been planning to do with it. I had a friend of mine who uh, went to a hardware store, it's like, where's the vacuum? I need to make a fan door. <laughs> I'm sure you were right. Always buy extra. Yeah. Never buy just enough to do your project because I guarantee you you will screw something up and you will have to go out to the store and buy more. Always buy more than you need because if even if you don't use all of it, it goes to the next project. Always buy more than you need. Collect materials always, even when it doesn't go towards your current project and you want to use it later, buy it then and save it for, the pro for another project. And when in doubt, Google it! <laughs> Question time. Yes? Okay, so when you're making something or designing something, do you want to stay away from keeping it too busy or is it just go for it, just lap it on there? I would <laughs> say make everything have a flow and a purpose. Don't just throw something on there because you think you want it on there. Make sure that there's a reason for being there. Like I said, if there's a logic to your design, if power throws through it with a cable, or there's some way we can tell it's doing something in the design, or let's make it feel like it's doing something in the design, go ahead and throw it on there. Make sure everything has a logical purpose for being on there. If you just throw something on there because it looks cool and doesn't connect to anything, doesn't feel like it has a purpose, then it's probably not a good idea to put it on there. Yes? I would say a good example of that is that they had a steampunk show at ASA this year, like three weeks ago, and then one of the best costumes I saw there looked amazing, except they had a cheap little pull handle for like a drawer, like a really chintzy little drawer, on the front of her blouse with no purpose, and it looked like it was a, you know, they didn't do anything to it, and it just took away from the whole thing. <coughs> if something's on there and it doesn't have a reason for being there, it looks horrible. Your mind kind of subconsciously rejects anything that doesn't feel like it has a purpose. If it's on there for just bells and whistles, that's one of the reasons I don't like having gears on it it's doing something. Your mind subconsciously rejects this, and it pulls you out of the reality that you're trying to create with your creations. Any other questions? Yes? What's one of the, do, you have, do you have any tasteful examples of gear usage? The only thing I can do. Right, this one right here. Okay. There, there's a piece of here. I think it works because it could be doing something. It's, it's in an area that's full of kind of, you don't know what it's doing, you know how it works. As the gears are doing something and they feel like they are contributing to the function of the device, it works well. If you're just saying, I'm going to take a bracelet, put a gear on top of it, it's steampunk. What's that gear doing there? What about the I mean, I like think if, if it's, it's like fabric, it's sort of different. Yeah, pulleys, if they're doing that, as a rule of thumb, if it's doing something, it works. <coughs> Any others? Yes? You mentioned that the like, strap going across the front was helping with like, the weight of like, the arm. Yes. How heavy is that? <laughs> um, not as heavy as the other one. I would say at the absolute most is maybe five pounds. But you're surprised how much five pounds pulls on your arm it's not weighted right. Because the weight's distributed across my shoulder down here instead of weighing all on my arm. My first one just came strapped across the arm here, and then strapped across my chest, and it just always was coming down, and it was always pulling on my arm. But if, I, if my hand's loose right now, it's not pulling on my arm, it's, pulling, it's messing on my shoulder blade. That has a lot more, a lot more comfortable than having to have your muscles constantly being holding your arm up <laughs> intense the entire time. Yes? Uh, I just wanted to compliment you on your vest. I think it's really great. Oh, thank did you, you. Did you get the material and make the vest? Or I did it? not make this vest. Oh, okay. I had a friend of mine make it, and I don't remember her contact information right now, but I could get it for somebody if they wanted it. She makes amazing Victorian replicas. She basically said, pick your material, pick your buttons. She sized me, and she made it for me. And it was amazing. It was like, I think, $150, and it was custom made to me. And that's what makes it awesome. Hmm. Yes? How much overlap do you have in between your leather plates on your gauntlet? On this one? Or well, where? just on any part of it. How much like overlap is um, it? It all depends on the joint. Here I have probably some of, some points about an inch. Some people have a little less. I have just enough so that so you have a it flows with. Going down? And on that one. I also have a piece that's going from here all the way through underneath that's carrying the load as well. I have just enough to cover the seams, I say. 
it all depends. I don't have a set size. I want to use much overlap. It's whatever it looks good and covers up the ugly parts. Any other questions? Yes. How do you use like light? If I wanted to like, have LED lights or something, how would I use yeah. that properly? There are two different really different ways to do lighting. You can either use LEDs, which take a little bit of knowledge to use if you want to wire them up, or the easy way is electroluminescent cable, electroluminescent wire. This is all yellow wire. It has a driver, which is underneath this pack. It has the batteries in it, and it has an on-off switch. This one I have here doesn't come with on-off switch, but I designed one. So in here, I just turn it, it turns on and off. And there's no soldering, no anything required. It's very, very easy. And yellow wire, you can cut short, and it will still work. The whole thing will work. So you can cut off the end of it, or keep working until you cut all the way through. Now, LED, um, the problem with um, using LEDs is just it requires a little bit of knowledge. The best thing I would say is look up Ohm's Law, and that will help you, you know, think about how to do a circuit and how to do circuitry. It really helps. It's not as hard as you think. You take, all you have to do is take the total voltage of a battery's output, figure out how much voltage your LEDs need, and then put enough resistors to make the total circuit's voltage equal to the LEDs required. So they won't blow out. Yes? For anyone actually making that, go to any site's web page. Look up samples, and you can probably get lots of free stuff that way. Yeah. And it's like under the guise of, oh, well, I'm a student, so give me, like, if you get up to three of certain micros or any any LEDs and stuff, you get a ton of free stuff that way. I just, <laughs> Cost bought, effective. <laughs> I just bought 100 LEDs on eBay for about five bucks. LEDs are really easy to buy, and they're really simple. They're just a light mini diode. Yes? Any other hands? <coughs> any questions? No other questions at all? Well, I think we're, I think that's a little early. Anyone have any other questions about how to make things? About props or in general? Any other questions? Yes? Can you put your friend's uh, contact information that made the best for you on the website when you have it? Yes, I'll put it on my website. If you want to go to the website, tinkersback.com, I'll make a post. Yep. Anyway, I'll make a post on there about contact information if you want to contact her about making you something. She's uh, local with Grand Rapids, so she should be able to get a hold of her. Any questions about making about making things? About Steve Punk? Well, comment if you're using a drone flooring and it's totally how you find a child to speak yourself. Oh, yeah. Um, this, this is you cutting discs? <laughs> cutting discs are notorious for breaking you apart and trying to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's a question that I always ask that most companies Does anyone have any tips for anyone else in the room that I've done cover that they know of that they would be useful for anyone else? Anyone have any tips for anyone else they would like to share? Nobody? Yeah. Your inclination may be to wear gloves. Don't. That's how the rest of your hand gets pulled in with whatever else. Exactly. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> you may get a little nick in your hand from a device, but it's better than having it grab the material and pull and ruin your entire hand. So, be similar. The best kind of safety you can use is the edge. You know, uh, a second in the mind is a minute in the world. You know. Yep. Uh, Tim, to everybody, when using, when you need to cut a lot of stuff, using exacto knives, I, a personal fan of using utility blade knives, lots of duct tape on your finger to protect them. Because mm -hmm. I cut I my phantom arm, you're using just the blade because you get more leverage instead of using exacto knife blade because they're too skinny. Oh, yeah, um, I did cut myself a few times, but I started duct taping the crap out of them. Duct tape's really not that easy to cut through with blades. So it protects your finger and it makes it like a thimble without having to buy the leather thimble for seven bucks because yeah. you yeah. gotta have a roll of duct tape in your house or you're not a real tool person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> duct tape is like the force. It's a light side and a dark side and it holds the universe together. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, any, anyone else any questions? Work? Yes. Um, you mentioned going to like Salvo for stuff. Yeah. It is a lot easier to find something at the Salvation Army that you can alter in an hour, then go out, spend sixty dollars to spend seven hours. Absolutely, yeah. Anything you can alter is better than something you can build. Uh, I I I totally agree with that. You can always buy a lot of cool stuff that you can alter. This originally here, 
I didn't have to look up on anything like this. It was originally the stand for a uh, for a lamp, for like one of those bell lamps. So I took I took the things that would hold the glass, bent them back, and used them as as the mounts. So something you can modify is always better than something you can build. Anything else? Anyone else? Yes. With the exact place and that kind of thing, the best kind of material to cut it on is actual cutting mats. Um, they sell them like Joanne's and the Hobby Lobby and Michael's and that kind of thing. We usually put coupon on them, but it's the best way to keep the blade sharp. You can find them not for the blades. Awesome. Can I get a picture of you under the better uh, lights in this room? Absolutely. I would Anyone else want to get a picture? Yes. Of me and my fiance? Yes, of course. Turn on the stuff.